Hello, I'm Alex Pierce, and I'm here to talk about our work on memory harvesting VMs inside of cloud platforms. Server memory today is very expensive, making up nearly half of the cost of running servers in today's data centers. And the but cloud providers have a lot of this memory resource just going unallocated in their systems. And to confirm this, we took resource metrics across all the servers in Azure for several weeks and found that at least half of the servers there have roughly 40% of their memory or more just going unused at any one time, which leaves us a great opportunity to make use of those resources in a beneficial way for the provider. We want to enable the provider to turn their unused memory resources into cheap offerings they can provide to users, but something different than the traditional infrastructure as a service that has clearly been unable to make use of these resources. So we look to target at things like platform as a service, software as a service, or function as a service offerings that the provider can offer. And we built, we took inspiration from the CPU-based Harvest VMs, which were a big step in running dynamic resources inside of a cloud platform area. So these are evictable VMs, and then but they can have their resources adjusted based on local host demand, so they can give a lower eviction rate over something like a spot VM that doesn't do this. So quickly, the way Harvest VMs work is if you have a host here with a few VMs, and then a Harvest VM which is harvesting a few CPUs. If one of those VMs leaves, the Harvest VM is then allowed to grow by the host into those additional VMs, making use of them where otherwise they would have gone to waste. So we've created memory harvesting virtual machines, which we built on top of the existing CPU-based Harvest VMs. Our MHVMs allow us to maximize this DRAM utilization, but not impact any regular or high SLA guests on there. And then we can accomplish all of this by assigning unallocated memory to our MHVMs for their temporary use. And then when we need to on that host, we can reclaim that extra memory on demand. And then we can do all of this memory changing by enhan with enhancements and building on top of existing dynamic VM memory techniques. We've identified and mitigated several challenges that do come up when using the these techniques in production. And then these changes ensure that MHVMs don't interfere with any co-located guests. The first platform challenge that does come up is VM creation time. So as VMs arrive and depart on hosts, we may need to adjust the memory that our MHVM is allocated. But this memory reclamation is very slow, unlike CPUs, on the order of maybe 10 gigabytes a second throughput. And ensuring that the MTM VM creation time is low is critical for the provider. So even if we were to add a second or a few hundred milliseconds to this creation time is unacceptable for them. And this scenario can easily come up as if we have here all of our host memory is full either with guests or our MHVM harvesting memory. So if a new guest needs to land, we have to wait seconds and seconds for our MHVM to return all of the memory necessary to run it. And it can't start until all of that memory is available. So we need to ensure that we do not impact creation time. The second platform challenge that can arrive is NUMA locality. So VMs can have their memory span different NUMA domains depending on how the allocator assigned to them, but this spanning generally is not surfaced inside of the guest. And that can lead to a loss of memory access locality because part of its memory, unbeknownst to it, is on a different NUMA domain, so it suffers additional latency in trying to access it. And then our MHVMs may exacerbate this existing amount of NUMA locality spanning by creating it itself. So if our MHVM is harvesting a lot of memory, which it's then spanned on the host, if it re returns a bunch of that memory back to us in order to make room for a new guest, that guest is now spanning as well, but it is not aware of it. So our MHVMs do have the potential of making new spanning worse. This potential new spanning becomes a serious issue when we start looking at the underlying applications inside of those VMs. So we took a VM and forced half of its memory to be on a different new node, creating spanning, and then ran several benchmarks on top of that, uh, a mixture of batch workloads and latency sensitive applications and found that all of them suffer some significant performance degradation when their VMs are spanned. So we need to ensure that we don't lead to additional NUMA spanning in the cluster. The final platform issue that can come up is host fragmentation. This can occur when reclamation happens because reclamation is done at a four kilobyte page granularity, but VMs are assigned memory mappings at larger page sizes like two megabyte or gigabyte even pages. So when our MHVM goes to return that our memory to us, that memory may be unaligned 4K pages or non-contiguous pages, which don't match up with the host memory mappings. 
So any internal guest fragmentation can directly lead to host fragmentation. And this can easily occur if our MHVM is ho holding harvesting a bunch of memory on the host. If a new guest needs to arrive, the MHVM doesn't, isn't aware of where all this memory it's returning goes to. So our new guest has its memory spread all across the host physical space. So we have, our MHVMs have the potential to fragment the host memory. And like new spanning, it also becomes an issue when it comes to application performance. So if we force some guests to be allocated four kilobyte pages instead of larger pages, it again sees significant performance degradation across all of those same benchmark applications. And most of this comes from the four kilobyte TLB page cache being having a much smaller memory reach than the larger page sizes. So you run into a lot of uh, contention and caching issues because of that. So we need to ensure that our MHVMs do not fragment host memory either. We were able to mitigate all of the platform challenges that can arise when using Harvest VMs or making several modifications to both the host and the way that MHVMs interact with the system. So the first of which we do to fix VM creation time is reserving a memory buffer on the host that's sufficient to accommodate incoming VMs. And then after VMs land, we can resize our MHVMs because we need to refill the buffer off of our critical path. And this is still important to do this resizing because we don't know when the next machine will land on our, on our guest. So we need to ensure that our buffer is always available. So to, in order to fix Numa locality, we have to do a few things. We found that balancing memory between Numa nodes was the most effective way of preventing Numa spanning. So we accomplished this by using our memory buffer that we've already had for VM creation time and having making sure that its allocation, its buffer allocations are mi roughly mixed evenly between the two, the two NUMA nodes on the server. And then we can maintain this with our MHVMs by doing NUMA aware resizing, where we expose the virtual NUMA topology in that MHVM, and then the host can ask it for memory back from specific NUMA nodes during resizing times. And then thirdly, fragmentation is extremely easy to fix. We can simply require that the MHVM only return large and contiguous pages that match the host mappings. And if it doesn't, we can simply demand, we can evict it. So it is required essentially to return this memory that way back to us. So with all of our changes here, we can then ensure that we have no impact by our MHVMs on any co-located guests. Well, we've managed to mitigate VM creation time with our memory buffer. We still need to ensure that memory resizing is op as optimized as possible because we can't guarantee when the next guest will be trying to land on our host. So we need to refill the buffer as quickly as possible. So we perform several changes to make this. For the first of which is pre-reclamation where the MHVM it knows that a resize is happening. So it starts allocating memory to return to the, get, the host before the host starts asking for more chunks. So the next time it asks, it's already ready. We can increase the batch size. So rather than the host asking for a few megabytes or hundred megabytes, it asks for a gigabyte or more at a time, which increases throughput. And then thirdly, for the guest side, if we, the host sends a pair virtual notification to the MHVM and in the applications inside, looking, telling them how much memory it's looking to reclaim, the application and then the guest there can free up that memory in advance, knowing how much it needs to return. And then orthogonal to these, we can run multiple MHVMs in which the memory from each of them can just be reclaimed in parallel. So because of all of these changes, we can, we've optimized memory resizing to have 30% higher th reclamation throughput. And then all the details are in the paper. So to look at now how memory resizing works on some host in detail, uh, we have this example. We have our host here with plenty of memory, a few guests already there. We have our new memory buffer, and then we have an MHVM which is harvesting some memory resources. If one of those guests leaves, our buffer still exists, but then our MHVM grows into those new memory resources that have been left unused by the guest leaving. And if a guest arrives, it, fills, it fits within the buffer. The buffer is refilled by shrinking our MHVM, which still has a few resources. If a new guest were to arrive, again, the MHVM shrinks, the buffer still exists. And if the host, and if the data plane decides to land a new VM here, we would have, might possibly eventually have to evict our MHVM. So it needs to be prepared for that. So then what kind of applications can we run on MHVMs? Because so they need to deal with a few different scenarios, which makes them not easy for anything. So they need to be able to handle evictability conditions. So any application inside needs to be aware that they have a 30 second cooldown before they get evicted. 
and they need to be able to handle that. And then they need to actually make use of these variable resources. So we found a few different classes of application that are suitable for such a system. Uh, the first one is the classic batch workload, uh, which performs things like data analytics, ML training, and such. These are very amenable to evictability. And then the second which is those that are capable of using our extra memory. So these become things like serverless applications, databases, caching systems that use extra memory greedily. And here we focus on fat frameworks. So for a few reasons, we can modify each individual application, but this requires some non-zero overhead. And then as the provider, if we target something like FAST or Hadoop or Kates, we can then offer those as services to users and then users don't have to worry about underlying allocations of resources. So the first of our MHVM applications we change is Hadoop, which we call MH Hadoop. So it's performing data analytics as a batch workload. So as, as VMs it's running on are allocated more memory, it can use that memory to spin up additional workers, which directly leads to better job throughput for Hadoop. And then as memory is reclaimed from those machines, or if a VM gets evicted, it can easily scale down its running workload and then move work around as necessary. And the second application we change is Azure Functions, which we call here MHFast, which is a function as a service or serverless application. So it's running latency sensitive user functions, which is very different. And then it can use this extra memory assigned to VMs to keep functions warm in the serverless parlance, which directly correlates to better end user latency. And then it can be intelligent with MHVMs by using a mix of regular and MHVMs to be evictable aware. And then it can run evictable safe functions on those MHVMs to avoid issues. So now looking at MH Hadoop in more detail, we can replay individual server VM and arrival events from our cluster. And then on hosts there, we can run MHVMs during the replay when possible. And we can look at the analysis. And as our MSVM, MHVM grows and shrinks with the arrivals and departures of regular VMs. So looking at that in detail for a single example, uh, we see that MH Hadoop can use the extra memory assigned to it as it, and it can run more workers. So at the beginning, it is its full allocation of harvestable memory and it has the best job run times. So it's using all of that memory to run workers. And then has to start, if it, as it has to start giving up memory, it has an increased job run time because it has few workers, but it's still making a throughput and it's still running, which is the important things. So it can directly use extra memory resources uh, to improve the job run times. Next, we look at the feasibility of running MHVMs on the cloud platform from a cost perspective. So our MHVMs are provided at a discounted cost similar to how spot VMs are accounted for, thus making them significantly cheaper than regular VMs from a cost perspective. Additionally, because additional harvest resources given to MHVMs at runtime are then discounted as well, because we want them, them to make use of those resources and not let them go to waste. So memory bound applications see a significantly better cost benefit, especially our MHFast here when running on an MHVM. So it is half as expensive to run per hour and compared to running on a spot VM or a harvest VM, and is leagues better than running on a regular VM. Hadoop doesn't do as well memory-wise uh, on an MHVM because it's not as memory-bound as MHFAS is, but it still is better because it can make use of that memory to run workers. So it's a little cheaper than running on a harvest VM and significantly cheaper than running on a spot VM or on any regular VM. Lastly, we look at the impact our MHVMs have inside of the cloud platform. To accomplish this, we take those VM traces and replay their arrivals and departures again across thousands of servers. We find that with all of these changes, our MHVMs have no impact on regular VM creation time or on their new spanning. And then on top of this, we can still harvest 20% of the free memory in Azure. And this free memory harvestability was again a trade-off between VM creation time and our memory buffer and harvested memory. So if we were to be willing to suffer some VM creation time, we can harvest up to half of the available memory. But since we don't want to have any of this VM creation impact, we can still harvest a good 20% of free memory. So in conclusion, we've addressed all of the challenges of running MHVMs inside of a production environment. And with that, we can convert and harvest 20% of the free memory inside of Azure today. We've extended several frameworks to transparently run on top of our MHVMs 
which then enabled the provider to cheaply utilize their spare resources as offerings to guests. So thank you for listening and please check out our paper for more details, experiments, and results.